Yes, it's Roger again, Mud Fossil University, talking today about one of the greatest heroes I have, secondary to a Velikowski, of course. Now, Rene Descartes, who is he? Well, you've heard the statement about, I think, therefore I am. And you say, well, well, that's kind of a silly statement. Well, it really isn't silly because you don't know if you're alive or not when you're dreaming. You think you're just normal and having a normal existence in your dream, and it is not real. So, is our existence real? You could argue that. And if you did, you would say, how can I prove my existence is actually real. Well, it's because you're actually thinking about it. So, you, in order to think about it, you have to exist. So, I mean, it's, it's sort of a backdoor way of looking at it, but it's about the only way you can prove that what we're going through is real. And I can also prove what we're going through is, is really fantasy. <laughs> it's a very strange world we live in. But Rene, good guy. Now, here's, here's why I say he's my favorite. Descartes refused to accept, refused to accept the authority of previous philosophers. Thank you, Rene. He frequently set the views he set his views apart from those of his predecessors because they were wrong. <laughs> In the opening section of the Passion of the Soul, an early modern treatise on emotions, Descartes goes so far as to assert <laughs> that he will write on this topic as if no one had ever written on this matter before. I love to go. His best known philosophical statement is, I think, therefore I am. But, I, literally, honestly, I'm telling you, I have been going through, after him, it just went, it, total, it became a total mess. Total mess. And then they started to make assumptions. Then they based everything on the assumptions, and that's just, everything was just terribly wrong. Terribly wrong. I mean, Rene did it all. He did everything. So, But here's what happened. They claim he had a vision. And listen to this. According to this guy, Adrian Belay, on the night of 10th to 11th, November 1619, St. Martin's Day, while stationed in Newburgh, en Dordogne, Descartes shut himself in a room with an oven, probably a cook stove, a cockle stove, to escape the cold, while within he had three dreams. Now, listen to what they say. This is what drives me crazy. And believe the divine spirit revealed to him a new philosophy. And that could be. However, <laughs> it is likely that while what Dr. Descartes considered to be his second dream was actually an episode of exploding head syndrome. <laughs> exploding head syndrome. I'm not kidding you. Can you imagine? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. What's the... the Exploding head syndrome. Conditioners experience unreal noises. <laughs> Who's to say it was unreal? <laughs> I'm telling you, it just doesn't get any better than this. I, uh, I don't know what to say, but I won't say it anymore. <laughs> okay, let me just calm down about this. All right, now, so his head explodes. <laughs> Upon accident, get I gotta stop. All right. Uh -huh. Upon accident, he had formulated analytic geometry while his head exploded. <laughs> and the idea of applying the mathematical method to philosophy during the exploding head syndrome. He concluded from these visions that the pursuit of science would prove to be for him the pursuit of true wisdom. <laughs> Yeah, well, his head exploded. That's why he had looking for true wisdom. An essential part of his life's work. Obviously, you want to find truth. If you find truth, you just found everything there is. And if you pl apply the truth to everything there is, you just found the absolute peace, justice, happiness, everything for everybody. Because truth is truth. If it's true, it's true. That's it. Case closed. But people, they see the truth and they cannot accept it. So let's just go on from that. He found all these things up while his head was exploding. Now, <laughs> where am I? <laughs> so it was part of the Descartes also. Now this is what, he, here's what I take away from Descartes. Because he, this guy was a, a genius, absolute genius. In every respect, in every field, he had a broad, stretching intelligence. He was no one-shot guy. Now, here's what he said. that It's true, absolutely 100% true. Break it down to the smallest bit. Start from the smallest little bit. Accept nothing. Start at the smallest bit and make it 
make it right. And that's what he did. So this Descartes also saw very clearly all truths were linked with one another. Obviously. You can't have a lie and then the truth and, and, and base it on a lie. It's ridiculous. So that finding a fundamental truth and proceeding with logic would open the way to all science. I 100% agree. And he discovered this truth quite soon. His famous saying was, I think, therefore I am, and therefore he could verify that he really was there. Now, I say there's only two particles in the whole universe, and everything is made of those two particles. And that brings up a theoretical um, discussion of who's in control of the process of life. Something's happening. Life is not just a, a bunch of little bumping together things that have no meaning. Something is very serious in life and somebody controls it. Now is there a central processor that controls it or is every single particle like ant intelligent? It certainly could be because I'm telling you when these things happen they happen and when they happen they happen quick. And when they happen, I, I can only determine there is guidance. Now, who guides? I'm down to that. And you can take any, any position you want. Say, oh, it's just all uh, random this and that. It just all does this. this, this. Revolution. Uh, big bang, dead dust. Boom, boom, boom. A little sex here and there. Have a nice day. We got life. Well, that is the most simple-minded approach to what we see that I have ever, ever heard. So, I am taking the approach that is not simple. It was directed, or is directed, or somehow became directed, but I am telling you right now that life right now is an orchestra of magnificent cooperation. Very rare that there's issues that arise in life. Life can take care of itself. But you, we're, we're causing a lot of issues with the life process, the chemistry of life. That is the issue. We're destroying the membranes that separate our vital tissues from the extracellular materials that are outside of these cellular enclosures. That's what's happening. The membranes are getting destroyed from chemistry, and they're getting invaded. That's cancer, that's chronic illness, that's pains and, 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 and um, soreness and um, chronic disease. And, and it, it can strike anywhere in your entire body. It's rheumatoid arthritis. It's all of those diseases. It, they're accumulations of things or things are not being removed correctly. And it's all related to the chemistry of your body. And that ends up being related to bacteria, enzymes, transition metals, carboxylation. All right, so let's go a little further with my good friend here, Rene. Now, I'm just going to do this very quickly and then we're going to go into the understanding of who controls these particles. Because I'm saying that particle sizes, there are no things called neutrons, or I mean, let's just, let's put it this way. Neutrons and protons are made up of electrons and positrons. That's all there is. And a part of the, these are the particle sizes. Their only difference is the spin polarity. A, a, an electron spins with the negative down attracted to the positive earth. Electrons go to Earth. Nobody can tell me they don't. You collect static electricity on you, which is nothing more than electrons. It jumps to the Earth because it wants to be at the Earth. That is the negative spin is on the downside. I, I'm, I'm just calling that an up spin. I, it could be a down spin, call it whatever you want, but the other one is opposite. The positron has the plus side down, which is not going to be attracted to Earth. However, for some reason, it does seem to be attracted to Earth. I cannot account for this. But the, between the two of them, that's the only two particles exist in the universe. That's it. Nothing else exists. Now, why do we see all these other things in material and different light and different colors? Well, they're nothing more than more and more and more and more pieces added together. And when you get to a neutron, right, a neutron weighs 1837 times an electron. Right? And the electron weighs the same as a positron because they both have the same voltage, only up one's up and one's down, minus and plus. They both weigh this amount. Times 1837 is one atomic mass unit. They call that a neutron. 
or a proton. It's right in the same ballpark. It's only off by this one number. A neutron and a proton are virtually identical weight except the neutron has one extra electron. That's all. 0.00054 AMU extra in a neutron. So what do we have here? This Anytime you see these three dots, it means therefore. It's a scientific notation thing. Neutron equals one atomic mass units. There's 919 electrons and 918 positrons make up that neutron. Therefore, neutrons are always net negative. They always have one additional electron. That always makes a neutron a negative particle. And they know this because they say, oh, it decays into a proton and an electron. Well, it's <laughs> that's amazing. It decays into a little more stability, which is just the proton. The neutron is a little less stable than the proton. Proton stability is 918 and 918. That is stable. It makes 1836. And that is what the weight and the whole thing, it weighs out perfect. It, it works out exactly flawlessly. Hydrogen 1, the protium, it is literally a neutron. It weighs exactly what a neutron weighs. It has one additional electron in the orbit. So the, proton, the, the nucleus of hydrogen is not one big proton. It's half positives, half negatives, plus one additional negative in the orbital outside because it fulfills its requirement of being neutral, 918 and 918, and then it says, can I come in here one extra electron? I say, yeah, all right, you can come in, but nobody else. He says, all right, anybody else comes, you tell them to stay right out around in this circle, and that's what happens to that guy. That is the extra electron. That makes your hydrogen. It's the only way you can make it. And then you have a zillion isotopes of hydrogen, and every other um, atom and element has all kinds of isotopes. So don't tell me it's just one, six of these, and six of those, and six of these makes carbon. All right, and then you know one, one, or one makes a hydrogen, and you know it's just not. It doesn't work that way. You have all of these particles, and then you can add an extra one or two here, three or four there, and they'll stay stable for a few seconds, and then they'll fall off of there. That's that's what they're. That's what that you know half life business is all about. So anyway, I think hopefully you understand that I'm saying there's two particles, and that is it. Case closed. So if there's only two particles in the whole entire universe, and here I am speaking to you, babbling on like this, trying to construct some kind of a thought process, what the hell is controlling that? Who's in control? This stuff just comes out of me. I don't know where it's coming from. It's coming from my mind. Is my mind controlling everything in my body? Did I just touch my head? Is, did my mind say to touch my head? I don't know. Maybe the molecules in my body say, we live in this, this enclosure, all right? That is our realm. And in this realm, we cooperate just like a group of ants. And if you don't do your job, I'm going to send out a guy and he is going to kill you. We call that apoptosis. So once you start getting out of line, doing something wrong, your chemistry is going to cause trouble to your neighbors. We're going to send out and harvest what you've got, and we're going to reuse it. All right? Everybody understand that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're good with that. All right, go do your job. Everybody do what you're supposed to. I don't want to have to talk to you again. You know, maybe there's just a little coordinator like that, or maybe there's just one big guy up there. Who says, oh, everybody got to talk to me before you can do anything. I don't think that's the case. I think every single one of these particular bits and pieces knows exactly what to do when it gets into a quorum of its peers. And they're all peers. There's nobody that's above anybody else here. But once you start putting them in blocks and chunks, that's when you get your red light, your, your green light is a little heavier, your blue light is heavier still, which is associate and knocks electrons. Every time blue light is heavy, it'll knock out electrons. You just drop a piece of blue light on something, it blows off electrons. You drop the red light on it and it just bounces off. It's like a ping pong ball. The blue light is like a cannonball. It just knocks everything out of its way. It's heavier and heavier. Then you get into x-rays and gamma rays and and all those, you know, heavy-duty particles, the cosmic rays, and all these big chunks of particles. 
All right, I'm just going to show you this. This is what they call quarks. And I'm saying the base of all matter is these two particles. And they attach to each other. The pluses attach to the minuses. But they're up and down spin. And I, I see these in the light experience. You see exactly that. You see dark light, dark light, dark light, dark light. And, and it looks like a torus. It's got spike coming up and spike coming down. There's some kind of a flow inside these particles. Those are photons. Then you got green is a bigger one. And you can have an extra half of one of these up and down. See, that gives you an extra up and downs. Then you get into the blue. You can go into extra half, a whole half of extra particles up and down. And then, you know, and then it goes the three colors together equals the white. A half a venturi will pull colors apart and it displays the white Higgs. I've shown all this in the light experiments. So, I mean, they're very, I have a ton of light experiments. And, and I show them many, 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 many times. All right, if I'm right, all energy exchange is electronic. There is nothing more than ups and downs, electrons and positrons. So everything is electronic, no matter what it is. The electronic flow is ether. Electronic flow is ether. These are those particles. The negative particles primarily flow. Right? The positives pull back. Ether is in and on everything. Ether is uh, uh, particles that are on every single thing there is. That's why almost anything can, can, can push electricity out of it. Insulators are a little different. So there's things that don't have extra electrons in them, but very few things. Uh, ether is free electrons. They're in the air, everywhere in the air. That's how you get static on you. You drive it to ground. Electro, um, stight, lightning comes through the air. Of course, there's resistance in the air. It doesn't want to go to, to, to ground unless it can get to ground easily. The air is a resistor. But the electrons flow like crazy. In the ionosphere, there's bazillions of them out there just saying, well, can I come down? I said, no, nah, we got plenty right now. But they'll just come down as they are needed. And then they are driven down during the sunlight hours. Now, because they're there all the time, the ionosphere is loaded with electrons 24-7. But it gets driven down during the day, and that's what gives you this, the burn. Now, um, ether static and it's lightning. Ether's electricity and it's heat. It's the heat. It's what flows in and makes heat. Cold is sucking the electrons, heat is pushing them in. Ether polarizes into those little polarized fields I show in the light experience. Ether is the smallest stable particle. It's the smallest stable particle. It's really, it's electrons that are, that are attached to water molecules, primarily in the atmosphere. But the electrons are flowing through space to us all the time. And there's photons, and there's cosmic rays, and there's chunks of solar particles, of solar wind. It's been thrown from the sun because the sun is being ripped through the galaxy on the arm of the Milky Way, scrubbing through ether, ripping particles off it and creating a huge magnetic field in it and bubbling solar flares and all kinds of magnetic activity and the corona of the sun is millions of degrees and the surface is only 6,000 degrees and the corona is millions because it's scrubbing through and our magnetosphere is 58,000 degrees our surface is 80 degrees and the magnetosphere is the source of our global warming and that's because we are scrubbing through the ether and it apparently is becoming more dense and therefore our magnetosphere will become more heated our magnetosphere will heat our planet that's simple as that it's not this carbon business that's fine let's get rid of the fossil fuels i have no problem at all whatsoever but that is not going to solve the global warming problem now ether is polar but it's always negative you know, and everything's polar. Electrons have a positive and a negative, but for some reason, they're more negative than they are positive. Now, ether weighs this much per particle, and it's minus one electron volt. I'm saying that's the negative part. 1837 particles, hydrogen, 918 positrons, 918 electrons. Net negative, there's no neutrons. All there is is positrons and electrons.